Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, your enthusiast guide to the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. My name's Dominic. And I'm with Jenna. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I just wanted to screw with her. Let me start over. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, your enthusiast guide to the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. (laughs) And I'm Jenna. (laughs) <laughs> this week, we're going to be talking about Season 1, Episode 16, because again, Pilot's two episodes for us, Smuggler's Blues, which has the the one and only Glenn Fry. This episode originally premiered on February 1st, 1985. It was directed by Paul Michael Glazer, who we may remember from Calderon's Return Part 2, and the writer is Miguel Pinheiro, who was Calderon in <laughs> Calderon's Return and in the pilot. So amazing. So he is around for, to write this episode. Before we get started, we have to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And uh, we have a little secret. We are together in person for this episode. We are hey. live. So we're actually able to look into each other's eyes and know the shame that we all watch Miami Vice <laughs> so forg- willingly. So forgive us as Jenna giggles throughout the entire episode. <laughs> no, all this means is that I can't do any of the stuff that I normally do while we're recording, like scroll through my Pinterest feed. We or can, I can hear you in edit typing on your keyboard. So <laughs> I know you're doing laundry. There's no secret. <laughs> So yeah, we we are actually all together in the great state of Arizona in an Airbnb unknown to the shenanigans that is happening right now in this recording. I'm sure the person that actually owns the house is ver- very curious to why we were bringing in so much heavy uh, electrical equipment. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's get started because this episode sucked. It was really, really bad. I can't believe but- I put pants on for this. <laughs> <laughs> this episode, though, we do have a lot to talk about because there's a lot. Of, even though it's bad, it's bad in a good way where it's bad and funny, not like Glades where it was bad and dumb. So uh, <laughs> let's go over to uh, and break down this episode. All right, guys, I have to say, this is really weird I'm able to look at you while we're doing this recording. So if I get lost in the storyline as we're going, it's because I'm just amazed that there's people opposite me and not my normal setup in my recording inside of my quote-unquote studio (laughs) at my house. If you want, you can go sit in the closet while you record. We'll sit out here. That's okay. I'm pretty sure we got enough cable. So (laughs) Yeah. Well... In this uh, episode, we get, you know, it's an okay opening. It wasn't the best, but it was okay. I I had. I I don't know. I actually did like the opening. Um, It was the rest of the episode that kind of crushed my spirit. You know what was weird, too, was seeing the episode? Didn't it look like it was recorded a long time ago? It did. We've said that a few times now, though, so I'm starting to wonder, like, how much of it. True. True. It could be bad. Over time. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, well, and one of the reasons why I like the open here is that it's a long open, and because it's a long open, that the song that they play at, the, at during the open, they play the entire song. Mm-hmm. And I happen to like Lunatic Fringe, and so I was jamming along to the song. So I don't think I actually liked what was going on. I was too busy kind of singing yeah. along. <laughs> Again, it's another stakeout. We start off with they're they're on a I don't know if it's a stakeout or they're ready to bust. I couldn't tell if that's what if they were gonna bust or if it was just a stakeout. Well, it was it was a stakeout. They weren't ready to bust because our Crockett was in the van with Tubbs and he went to get out. He's like, no, we're just observing. Mm-hmm. And they watched everything happen and followed him back to where he was going. So at least they weren't gonna bust him until they saw where he was coming from. Yeah, and they were so they're following this smuggler. Who and it seems like Tubbs is leading the investigation, but like the whole vice team is there, right? Yeah. Like there's there's all all hands are on deck for this. Yeah. There's even a bunch of fishermen there as well. <laughs> yeah, there's all these people that's fishing. This it seems like there's people fishing off that bridge just twenty four hours a day. Yeah. Just and they some late night fishing time, that's all. It's <laughs> oh. not weird, it's not strange at all. And no. they're serious. They don't even break stride as this random guy walks up and throws a uh suitcase into a speedboat that pulls up out of nowhere. What do you yeah. want to figure that they that those people are like not even actual paid extras, but that just people who are actually trying to fish the area and they, <laughs> they and just they're just happen recording to be there. around this, and the people just didn't yeah. want to guess it, like it's, second guess it at all. Yeah, and this is probably the the least weird thing that they have seen right. hanging out on this bridge. Right. Yeah, they're following the smuggler, and he gets like a car pulls up, and they hand him a package, uh, and there's like a, a brief argument maybe between the people inside of the car. It's all in Spanish. There's the message is like this is. 
what took you so long? This is to, to protect my family. So he finally gets it. He goes to this bridge. And as he's standing, he's looking for, and as he's standing there, a boat comes from underneath the bridge he, and he drops the package into the boat and then the boat just drives off. The smuggler then, le- like he sprints from there, gets in his car, slams on the gas and runs to, a, I'm calling it a houseboat. But it's not a houseboat, is it? It's like an old timey Dixieland. I think it's meant to be a houseboat, though. Uh huh. But yeah. it's, it's yeah. big. Just, it's really big. I, I I'm starting to think that they keep using the same kind of dock space because they keep blowing up the same thing. That's my theory right mm-hmm. now. Is that I've seen this dock before, and I'm pretty sure I've seen this houseboat. So <laughs> yeah, but it was I was surprised at how big it was. mm Hmm. So the smuggler, he, he pulls up in front of his houseboat, sprints into the house, and you can see someone inside, like shadow of someone inside of the house is tied up. And the duo is just watching from outside, from oh, the yeah. inside of their car. It's and it's about then... to get kinky. <laughs> Did you see that shadow? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Some was... bondage stuff going on in there. Zito and Spartek getting real interested all of a sudden. You got, you got Zito popping forward in the in the, the white white beater and mm-hmm. he's like half cast in shadow. This is what he's living for. <laughs> well, it's short lived because then the houseboat explodes. And if you remember when the house exploded in what was that episode before? Was it Golden Tri? No. If, yeah, it was Golden Triangle Part 1 where yeah. we were like, why did that just blow up? Yeah. <laughs> yes, the serial bomber is back. <laughs> <laughs> and it just never gets resolved. Maybe they really should be investigating again. this. It didn't just blow up. It like imploded into nothingness. It, it was, the explosion was so big. Now this and this brings up something with TV is that things tend to blow up in TV shows a lot more often than in real life. I don't remember hearing very uh, very many stories about stuff randomly blowing up. No. I mean, not even when it, like you're you're reading a story about like a drug cartel. You you never read like oh and they blew up his house, you know. So I'm just it, it it's just strange that the that these type of shows always immediately go like like we need to kill this character off. How should we do it? Let's let's blow it up. Well, I mean, I think that that's just a sign of the 80s in general, right? Because then even if someone's not intentionally trying to blow something up, when two cars hit each other, they explode into like massive... Well, as we've seen in this show, like that's just the way you handle things, right? C4 is plentiful on the streets of Miami. Uh Water makes cars explode. Yeah. (laughs) Houses blow up for no reason. There's literally no reason they just blow up. Or they just at least never answer why they blow up. I just think it's fun blowing stuff up. Mm-hmm. Little tiny models. They like to blow up little models, and so that's what they that's what they like to do. So after it blows up, we go to the opening credits. We come back from the credits, and we at the precinct, and the entire vice team is meeting with the homicide detectives. And you get the sense of like this investigation was really big. There was, I mean, the entire vice team and these outside homicide detectives were involved in the case as well. In particular, the vice team is not happy with how things went down. There was a bunch of killing, like the gangs had killed a bunch of people including some children it sounded like but there's this one guy i don't know just one homicide detective who's like he says like he seems kind of blase about the investigation his name is lieutenant jones interesting how we get we get this in the very very beginning meeting someone for mm-hmm. the first time and this happens to be another story about a crooked cop which is like the third or fourth episode in a row that we've had cro- crooked cops i mean miami oh. date is just nothing but crooked <laughs> cops apparently i just like the attitude that crockett has with him because it makes me think that um, secretly all of the other cops in the precinct probably don't like Sonny. In fact, they probably hate Sonny. Uh, he seems like that that guy, you know. Yeah, I mean, you kind you you get the impression that Sonny is the person that they go to when they suspect or want to investigate any of this. So he's kind of like the whistleblower. Isn't yeah, he? I, I I can just picture Tubbs telling like at bar or Christmas party telling all the other cops like you don't know Sonny like I know Sonny. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to make excuses for. Him. <laughs> well, the there's like a some tension in between them. Lieutenant Jones, who has his leave, is like, how about those dolphins? And then he leaves, he closes the door, and Tubbs runs over the door, opens the door, and looks out angrily into the hallway. I Taking his that. cues from the birdcage? Or <laughs> <laughs> did he fossey away? <laughs> and then, like, it just seems like that's the end of it. Right? That's All these people are dead. They've picked up they don't know where to go from here as the room is clearing out castillo gets a call and he answers the phone 
And you hear him just like, yes, yes, yes. And he's like, I do have some people. They're the best. And I'm like, oh, interesting. I'm so not he, sure about my long distance. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and he says, Sunny Tubbs, or Crockett Tubbs, stay. Does Castillo, does Castillo love Crockett and Tubbs as much as we do? I, I, think, oh, yeah. I think so, because in the later scene, they're in a room uh, eating lunch together. And it is very casual, and it is clearly no one else invited to this lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Castillo says, like, four words outside of the episodes about him. He says, like, four words in the entire series. So the fact that he's sitting down and eating lunch with Tubbs and Crockett says a lot about, I think, the nature so of the So was there a code for the Vice team then that, because after Golden Triangle, that you are immediately closer if you've seen each other in a Speedo? <laughs> I think so. I think that's what did it. So know? that's what the B team needs to do to get to get better. Because yeah. as we see in the next episode, I have premonitions of this scene with the B team on top of the van with a bug. The B team <laughs> really needs to get their shit together. Please don't put the B team in Speedos. Just don't put the B team in Speedos. I don't want that. <laughs> well, we jump from there and we go. Tubbs and Crockett are going to where Castillo told him to go meet up with someone. That doesn't say who. This is go go here. They pull up. They walk down this long, dark hallway. They get, or like a like an alley. They get to the end of the alley. And at the end of the alley is Castillo, Trudy, and a DEA agent named Ed Waters. Now, so, why couldn't Castillo and Trudy carpool with Tubbs and Crockett? Yeah, why the- couldn't they ride together? <laughs> I, mean, why did, I don't understand why they had to go separate. Especially because Trudy's involved in this. So if Trudy was already involved and then you got Tubbs and Crockett, if you said that Tubbs and Crockett were the best, but Trudy was involved from the beginning, wouldn't the ladies be the best? And I think this is setting up our problem with... with Only Trudy. (laughs) (laughs) Do you ever see Gina going above and beyond and looking up names or doing any of that research? We have proof that Gina will go as far as necessary. Yeah, she went above and beyond one time. We know that for sure. <laughs> that didn't benefit anyone on the Vice Squad. So it was still um, impressive. I have a theory. Like, so Crockett and Tubbs, they need to ride alone because every time that they're in the car together, they just have to shoot sidelong loving glances at each other, and they can't have other people involved in that. Do you know how awkward that is to be because <laughs> they in the back seat? No, and you see was Tubbs it? staring. But at that's Crockett true. That's true drives. because once it in Golden Triangle when they were going around to the Thai food restaurants looking for the immigrants. So Tubbs and Castillo were going around together. Wasn't Castillo sitting in the back seat yeah. when they were driving around? Uh, <laughs> yeah. He was like, I'm not, do- I'm not doing that again. Well, I'll then, ride with Trudy. But in part two, then Crockett starts saying, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get in the back seat. Don't worry. Yeah. I'll get in the back seat. It's going to be yeah. fine. Uh, they can't do it. They have a dynamic and that shift can't be no, upset. You know, you know what I think it is, is that you see them driving around in the convertible all the time. And I think one of them has IBS or something. <laughs> They just they, they they need the air because he's just stinking up the car and Castillo's like I, I I just can't take it I rode with him one time and Judy's like I know I know we, we'll take my Mazda we do know how sweaty Tubbs is but it's not his fault he's got like a glandular problem or something it's totally it's not his fault hey, Cuban food is very popular in Florida I'm just saying. <laughs> Well, here's the story that we get from Ed. Ed Waters, the DA agent. He's been on assignment for six weeks. He's following smugglers. And on the routine, smugglers are getting killed. Not just killed. Like, them and their whole families are getting killed. He thinks that someone, some, someone from law enforcement is tipping off the person behind the smuggling. And that's why all the smugglers are getting killed before they can get busted. And I feel like not only, so he says it's someone from law enforcement. He's like, yeah, it could be FBI, DEA, vice coast guard. (laughs) And I feel like, like I think coast guard's a little far away here. Because the last time that they went on a tangent talking about all the different acronym government agencies, it was, who are they? CIA, FBI, IRS. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they just like to throw At least IRS out. is a little closer. A little closer, <laughs> I mean, yeah. The IRS I mean, is a little further away. Coast Guard is a little closer. Right. Coast Guard is a little know. bit you know, more believable. Do you know why you have to be six feet tall to be in the Coast Guard? In case your ship sinks, you can walk to shore. <laughs> Here's, here's what they come up with. And they propose to Tubbs and Crockett, if they're willing to accept, they're going to go undercover as smugglers. 
They're going to have no backup. They are totally on their own. They're going to be given $1 million to use to do whatever they see necessary. They're going to have to travel to Cartagena. And Trudy is going to be the family bait, which is totally a setup for what we know from the beginning with the houseboat blowing up that the smug, the drug, the dealer behind this smuggling is uses the family of the smuggler as um, a way for control over them. Which this is clearly smart on this DEA agent's part because he could have gotten another male DEA agent and a female DEA agent and not involve Miami Vice at all in this operation. But he's like, I don't want to get shot in Colombia. I'm going to get Vice involved and make them go down there. And, which makes no sense. Why, why are state police officers or county or city police officers, in this case, Miami Vice team, uh-huh. why are they traveling internationally? Why are they traveling internationally? Why are they traveling internationally? while breaking laws because they are hiring a smuggler they are buying drugs they are do they are eventually we will learn committing murder in another country uh, <laughs> in which they don't have jurisdiction so yeah it is a uh, very interesting that they would choose a couple vice cops to send on this very very important mission no, and more Every, important, everything that you just mentioned is all in the flyer for the Miami Vice Police <laughs> Department. So, do you need someone who will freely kill, who will encourage others to kill, who can come up with a quick way of disposing of several dozen bodies in the Miami <laughs> Gla- in the Florida Glades, <laughs> is willing to travel abroad and do shady deals? We've got the people for you. And it's like literally just Tubbs and Crockett and Ju- Trudy and Gina just like back to back <laughs> in a flip out. I think, Jenna, on the next part, that you have something to say about this. Because aside from our team being international killers, Trudy is super disappointed that she is not traveling to Colombia as part of the vice team. She says, well, I'll update my passport. And Castillo says, like, no, no, you're staying here. You're the family bait. And she looks crushed. When Castillo says that. Yeah. Like, so I'm assuming up to this point that she was given no context, just like the guys. So when she hears the details of the story, she's thinking, okay, so I'm one of the ones that have been brought in because he, like, Castillo sees me as, like, one of the strong people on the force. It actually seems like she's involved earlier. Yeah. Like, she was... Mm -hmm tangentially aware of what was happening yeah so she gets like built up and thinks this and then castillo just pulls the rug like totally gives her the shaft and says no like you essentially i just need you to be barefoot in the kitchen for the next you know couple weeks while the guys take care of this so just look pretty and uh you know hopefully someone will try to kidnap you and this will work (laughs) all out just fine it is clear she is she is realizing her role is the secretary and it is just crushing her and it comes up later yeah. too when you know spoiler she gets captured when gina says she'll go in and get trudy and castillo's like no right crockett's gotta go get trudy yeah we can't not- have here we gotta have crockett and a porn star go get, <laughs> go get trudy <laughs> out of a, what looks like clearly like a porn set uh-huh. <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know if this is supposed to be i would i mean i would think that this is going to come up again later uh, but they've up to now painted Trudy and Gina as very independent, strong, competent officers like police uh, on the vice department. And so now we're really pointing out times where they're clearly being placed second class to say, no, you're not as good as B team. You're not as good as Tubbs and Crockett. So we're not going to put you in the way of that. You like all of their function is just very administrative or like really low grade stuff that they do with the guys that are working the street. Yeah, and it's bad enough that they make half as much as the guys do. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's got to be frustrating. And now getting just like basically told, you know, let the boys do the work. Um, it, it's it's definitely frustrating, especially like uh, for me, because I keep waiting to see Trudy actually have her moment on this show. And there keeps getting close, right? Like this was thought this was it. No. Think next week's it. No. Nope. Like, it just mm-hmm. keeps getting so, so close. The duo eventually decides that they'll say that, that, that they're going to go do this. They're going to have fake history. Start working with some guy named Morales. And they just hand over their badges to Castillo. It's like, we're not cop. Or essentially, we're not cops for this mission. Tubbs says, now they need to figure out how to get to Car- Cartagena. And Tubbs knows the guy. So, Tubbs knows the guy. So, we're going to star wipe over to Ace. And this was, this was a weird 
scene, right? So they come into, it's like a party that's going on, or it's just like a dealer house, right? There's just like a party always going on. Ace is like this super strung out dealer, and he is like loaded. Oh, I yeah. can't stand loaded Tubbs knows him and he's asking who Crockett is but there's like I don't know how Tubbs knows him does, does he just keep contacts on the street he knows him from no oh no he does not know him no because it's the same actor <laughs> but it's not the same person <laughs> yeah so maybe he maybe Miami Vice is just getting confused on their own where they're like oh yeah we'll just play that they know each other because we've totally had this guy on the show before this guy's so strung out he Probably couldn't tell it. Tubbs apart from anyone else. All I know is Tubbs is one smooth-talking jive turkey. <laughs> and it's a total setup, right? They come in, they say they want to know a guy, and then the B-team come busting in like they're going to break. They're, they're, they're busting down the place, right? Tubbs and Crockett grab Ace and drag him out by the arms. Like, the, like they, and then they tell him, like, Harold and Kumar, Pineapple Express style, like, we just saved you, bro. Can you help us out and tell us who this we want to know a pilot's name and he mind tells you them, they're using so much fabulous 80s slang at this <laughs> point yes <laughs> one thing that was missing was some ladies with shoulder pads <laughs> uh-huh oh yeah no the, the the uh tubs trying to be cool is amazing especially now because it's tubs trying to be cool in 1985 so everything is rad and and jive and you down <laughs> man <laughs> And, and Tubbs is totally playing the whole part. So he eventually gets out of them. Uh, they're looking for Jimmy. And Jimmy's out at, quote, the hangar place. So just a quick question. Was the B squad in on them dropping by there as well? As I'm, all I'm, is like a, an elaborate setup? It's got to be a setup. Get yeah. this guy? Okay. Yeah. But, you know, I remember when I watched the scene, I, when they kicked the door in, like, you, you can't even really see it's the B team. Like, you don't even really see the their faces you just the door kicks in they grab and drag them away so you don't even really see who it is that kicks in the door you just kind of get the idea like okay like a bust is going down and that's what they're using as leverage so we head out to the hangar to go find jimmy it's an airport but like maybe like an old world war ii or vietnam war airport that's now in total disrepair there's planes scrap, scrap planes all over the place weeds are growing over the runways they come into a hangar and they find a man playing a guitar with his back to them with a and a microphone uh, uh, up on top of an airplane turns around and it's glenn fry glenn fry of the eagles, the eagles. Now, I have to say, I am an Eagles fan, but I'm less of a Glenn Fry fan than I am of a Don Henley. It's fan. all about Joe Walsh. Yeah, Joe, Joe or Bus. You guys are weird. No. Have you seen what Joe Walsh has turned into? Have you seen his recent live performances with the Eagles where he's wearing pajama pants on stage? That's what I love him. Okay <laughs> That's why I love him because he, he's, he's like your grandfather. He's not all there, you know? <laughs> he's only got one shoe on. This... He's like another strung out guy too, right? Like he's a burned out Vietnam vet. We find out later, but he's into some drugs. Who knows what kind of drugs it is, but he's into some sort of drugs. He says that it'll cost them 25 grand. If they, he, the duo can pay him 25 grand, he'll fly them to Cartagena. And he's incredibly trusting considering these two guys just walked up to him randomly and said, Hey, we'll pay you to fly us somewhere. I think this is part of the backstory because they're supposed to have fake backstories so that they know this guy named Morales. And that's what's given them cred throughout the rest. I think that's what's supposed to be yeah. without ever actually saying it because you know details aren't important in miami Uh uh-huh and i i'm i'm trying to think of past episodes was there a morales that they busted and or killed in any of those episodes that they that they are using for this like should we know who morales is because we never meet him in this episode no no and i don't think we're supposed to know who he is there's just it's just someone that that this dea guy knows some of my favorite stuff from the episode happens in this scene though yeah so can can we talk a little bit about the about hit the, like the slang and the way that they're talking back and forth? Like, Dino Mike, like uh, Jimmy. So so Glenn says to them, "I ain't John. I ain't John Wayne. I don't have an S on my chest. So be brief about your business <laughs> <laughs> when you get there." So like just being very clear that he's only their pilot. Like twenty five grand's gonna get. That's I, like, what he says I will, now. I will get you. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's what makes it so much better. As soon as they get there, and all of a sudden <laughs> he's like Crockett's BFF. He's their backup for everything. Thing. The other thing that, that is fit, my, my, fit, fit, my favorite line from this episode, and, I, and I'm and i sad that it didn't go on through the whole thing, 
But they're like, Tubbs is ne- negotiating with Jimmy. And Jimmy says, he asks him like, hey, what are you guys doing? It's like, that's our business. And Jimmy replies, if I ask you no questions, you tell me no lies, right? And then Tubbs says, dynamite. Dynamite. That's his response to it. Uh-huh. So it's like my two favorite things of like, okay, did they, one, the writers just didn't know how to respond to that. And two, like, is Glenn Fry going to speak in song lyric puns throughout <laughs> the entire episode? Because that's clearly a line from a Leonard Skinner song. Yeah. And that's it, it, what it feels like just from the very beginning of them meeting Glenn Fry is that this is like a team up episode. Like when Scooby Doo would do, would uh, have the Harlem Globe Charters in an episode, <laughs> you know, like it makes no sense, but it's, it's, and it's full of just a bunch of bad puns, but they do it once a year because people like it for some reason. They, I mean, you're right. They agree pretty fast. Like 25 grand. We're going to, you're going to fly us there. Oh yeah. My name's Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so then he, he like he says, okay, let's go. Like, let's go now. Yeah, I, that's, I'm ready. That's pr- pretty much what happens. We have a short scene where Tubbs goes and drops Trudy off at like the family apartment. Uh, and then they go ditch the car. They go so, park Tubbs' car near a lake. And they hide a gun on it. Which yeah. I at first thought was like a tracking device. But the, it's a gun that they put oh, underneath okay. there. So it is, do they set the car up? Is that after he shows them the plane and tells them about how he bought it was a lemon? That's, no, that's, that's, that's next. When they, that is, that is when right they get back, when after Tubbs drops Trudy off at the safe house and everything. Okay. Yeah. So after dropping the car off, they head back out to the hangar and they're, get, they're getting ready to take off. And we have, this is another awkward scene. Jimmy is awkward throughout the entire episode. He is always the awkward piece that, that is in every scene. But then you add in Wavy Davy, <laughs> and, and I was just like seriously struggling to get through this part of the episode. Like, yeah. I, it, I don't take enough drugs to have that make sense, <laughs> have that whole interaction make sense. They're getting ready, and Jimmy is talking about how he got the plane. He said, I have a quote written down here. The guy who I bought it from said it was a lemon. It may look like a cow, but she runs like a stallion. <laughs> what? That is a real line. Like, what? Let me, let me read that again. She may look... Sorry. The guy who I bought it from said it was a lemon. It may look like a cow, but she runs like a stallion. So lemons equals cow. And it's got a lemon sticker on the side of it, too. Uh, stallion. All this seems all. like a good SAT setup. All in all, we know that there's about a 50-50 chance they crash on their way to Columbia. <laughs> yeah. The only important thing that we get from this from this scene is that we meet Wavy Davy. Wavy Davy is the mechanic that works on the airplane. He's the guy that Jimmy trusts the most with all of his operations. He's the one that holds down the home base, essentially. He likes we get French a fried little. Potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> He's so fucking weird. He's so weird. I can't handle Wavy. I can't put my finger on he looks like someone else. So I looked up who the actor was and it's not not who I thought it was. But he looks just like someone else. I can't put my finger on him. We have a short flying montage and Crockett is super nervous about flying in that plane. And there's a couple jokes. Tubbs is making fun of him. And then Jimmy says you might want to put on those parachutes because they're about to leave the ground. So they're like they both making fun of Crockett being nervous flying on this plane. And we just Star Wars wipe out to Cartagena. Dominic, are you thinking about the the driver in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yes. Because it's the same guy. It is the same it guy? It is him. It is the no same way. guy. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, that's exactly who I thought it was. I didn't know it was the same guy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So Wavy Davy steals Ferraris too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna watch I'm never gonna see that movie the same now. <laughs> yeah, no. Wavy Davy's life went in weird directions, that's for sure. <laughs> we get to Cartagena, and we learn now that, like, hey, Jimmy's actually giving them, like, door-to-door service. Jimmy walks them to the to their, like, where the place that they're staying, carrying their bags. And then they hand him a gun, and they ask him to stand guard and look out over the courtyard where they're going to have their meetup with Grossero to, to buy the drugs. There's apparently <laughs> a lot of bonding going on in that in that plane ride from miami to columbia yeah and wavy davy or uh, i'm sorry not wavy davy jimmy jimmy seems very uh open to criminal activity in the way that he already explains like hey i'll back you up i'll shoot someone for you but he, but, he says in the beginning like that he doesn't believe in violence too though. yes 
He yes. starts going full on like where you think, is he having a flashback? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like is he just not quite sure where he is in real life? Or he's just like, shoot him, shoot him, we gotta run away. <laughs> so let's get back to the fact that Tubbs and Crockett found a drug dealer in Cartagena very quickly. So, and that's part of the Morales backstory. But what's crazy is that they landed, got to their place, and immediately stood guard and went down to go meet for, for the deal. Like, how? How? I can't even schedule meetings with people inside of my office uh, exactly. for, for the right time, let alone I've been trying to meet in with another a country in play in person. Uh huh. I've been trying to meet with a customer of mine for a month now, with the only stipulation being that it has to be after four o'clock on a weekday, and I just can't make it happen. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so I've had to deal with scheduling a lot of meetings with people who consider themselves very important. And their availability is usually before 7 a.m., after 7 p.m., before 9 p.m. And it's, <laughs> so I have no idea how they were able to set this up. Like, yeah, but it's, it's bam, bam, bam. They, they're right on it. They go right to meet Grossero, which is a, which is a great villain name. Right? Uh-huh. Gr- Grossero is a good name. Like, you really half-assed it there, didn't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Couldn't figure out if it was the name of a grocery store or an Italian mob boss. <laughs> yeah. So they go to meet Grossero, and Tubbs just immediately starts insulting Grossero and like Wait. challenging his authority and like talking him down on price. They have a they have a million dollars. Yeah, they have money to work with here. Okay, but hold on, they get to keep that cool mill, so why not try and get this shit on the cheap? Okay, we want Walmart service. Yeah, we spent a million dollars. I like, just, it's expensive to keep a pet alligator alive. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole bag of dog food every time he eats. <laughs> uh, I'm just, you guys remember what the plot was, right? <laughs> the idea is they're gonna pretend to be smugglers. And they're going to use Trudy as bait to catch whoever's killing the people's family who they're forcing to be smugglers. At no point do they care about getting drugs cheaper. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if they're actually there to do what they're supposed to be, shouldn't they just give them the million and say, all right, we'll take our keys, fly the F out of there? Yeah, well, we cause... already know that that's not how they work, okay? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, they're supposed to pretend to be smugglers because they've never done anything like this before. And Are you good... serious? They're trying to get a cool discount on that product so they can run a little bit on the street. Crockett needs to get a new a new ride, all right? Maybe he needs well, another St. Vitus. He just got a Lamborghini in the last one. <laughs> uh, see? It's very expensive. What about the cost of all of those neon shirts? Okay. <laughs> Imagine how quickly you go through shoes when you are walking in, t- in right. sand and never wear socks. All right. But seriously, w- were you guys disappointed that Tubbs didn't use a Jamaican accent? <laughs> yes. So, I, w- I, so I for sure thought the Jamaican accent. It actually would have been better up. if they did their Dallas accents. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the meeting goes terrible. They're, they're, it's a lot of like um, peacocking, I guess. Like they're like just trying to show off who's who's stronger, mm-hmm. right? And so the duo leaves, and and Crockett seems like he's not involved in this at all. He's like Tubbs' his muscle, right? He's not really like that. He doesn't talk to Gro- to, to Grossero ever in any of these exchanges. It, do you ever it's... notice? Do you ever notice that that's how that usually goes down? Like think back to what's uh, the great McCarthy when. Tubbs is the one that goes over and talks first to McCarthy while Crockett is just peacocking. Riding his boat <laughs> He's just around doing back the laps inside like, of the marina. Clearly, they see that Tubbs is the person. That, mind you, this yeah. exchange maybe doesn't go very well, but like he, like he, he's able to, to plant that seed that bugs the person mm-hmm. in a way that Crockett's not. Yeah, I think that Tubbs has definitely taken more of the undercover or the contact role I, well he's taking the lead role because clearly only the only thing crockett really cares about is boats and, and things outside of dealing with drug dealers it seems like his job is what pisses him off it seems like everything that he uses for his job he enjoys mm-hmm. i think that crock is just a little too sensitive to get very like deep in the nitty gritty of all of this right like he we tend to stuff see that, gets under his skin yeah, that real he, easy that he can't quite handle it at that level where like Tubbs is able to weather that a, quite a bit better uh than- well when, when they leave from the meeting with grossero they're immediately attacked by grossero guards 
They start walking down an alley. Two guys come running up from behind him. Very awkwardly running, by the way. I don't know if they had like something sticky on the bottom of their shoes or something as they were running down the alley. Maybe it was really slippery. I don't know, but it was, they were running very awkwardly. Tubbs and Crockett start running. A car comes from behind them and tries to ram Tubbs or Crockett, I think. And Tubbs is on the other side. Crockett does like a sweet spin move over the top of the hood and they like fight with the driver. Tubbs is able to get, Crockett's able to get the gun from him, and the two guys who are running down the slippery alley just stop, kneel down, and start praying in the middle of the alley. Oh, no, no, no. It's as Tubbs and Crockett are running down, Tubbs does the, the flip over. Jimmy pull, pops out of nowhere and pulls a gun on Crockett, and then Crockett takes the gun from Jimmy, and that's- Oh yeah, and he's pissed. He's pissed about it. He, like, gets heck mad at him. And is like, don't ever pull a gun on me. Yeah. And again, Jimmy is in, like, flashback mode where he and has to, like, And that's when the guys just himself. give up. Well, no. So, so yeah, yeah. So, J- Jimmy comes down. The guys give up. The cops come pulling up. And Tubbs is still, even though Jimmy did that, right? Tubbs is still in a brawl with the driver of the car that tried to ram him. Mm-hmm. Jimmy forces Crockett to run away. Who at gunpoint's like, no, you're leaving right now. And then Tubbs gets captured by the Cartagena police. Tubbs has been arrested. Crockett and Jimmy run away. They go back to their room, which is conveniently right above where all this stuff just happened. Jimmy sees his inn that now this is for him, time for him and Crockett to have like their time. Their right? bonding time. Yeah, exactly. Jimmy's going to take over Tubbs's role. And just, <laughs> Tubbs is gone. They're, they're already talking about Tubbs like he's dead. <laughs> right jimmy's trying he's to gone convince- man he's gone he's never coming back yeah jimmy talks jimmy's down and crockett i calms that, like, him down yeah i am just wondering was there a tub shower scene in prison with like a slow-mo shower scene <laughs> in prison that they just cut out of this let's never find out <laughs> well the they have like this long talk we find out that both i don't know have we been introduced before that crockett served in vietnam has yeah. he talked about that before in the okay. opener because remember we talked about how he was like the star football player and then yeah, served in yeah. vietnam and but they haven't talked about it beer. since yeah they haven't talked about it since so now we mm-hmm. have a conversation both jimmy and crockett served in vietnam they they have like a deep conversation about losing people and crockett saying like i'm not losing him yeah and um, we are getting tubs back and this is when crockett and jimmy become his best friends forever you know, it's, it's like that, you know, the v- hey, Jimmy ends up taking a bullet for him before the end of the episode. So mm-hmm. Crockett even gets a little, he gets a little teary eyed while he's talking about tubs and getting them back and stuff. Again, Crockett's a sensitive soul. Okay. We go back, we go over to the jail and this is where tubs, is, he's getting worked over by the Cartagena police he's tied down to a chair, slapping him around. He eventually goes in to see a lieutenant to do Toto. The U- he gets a like a fax from the U.S. government. It's the it's his fake history, which shows Tubbs how many times he's been to jail, he's been to Rikers, all the things he's been arrested for, you know, from the fake history. And just and then, as quickly as it started, it ends. The lieutenant releases him. He says he'll tell Grossero that he's clean and hopes he sees the lieutenant as an ally. And so it's a real short scene. It ends way fast, but I'm 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 confused here because does the lieutenant say that because he's in good with Grossero and Grossero? Asked him to just to follow up on Tubbs, or is it because he got a wink, wink, nudge, nudge from the Miami Vice team or the DEA saying because they're partnered up with the Cartagena police? See, yes. I think that they're trying to portray the Colombian cops as being dirty or in Grossero's pocket. I think that's what they're the angle they're going for. I am more impressed by Tubbs' cover ID. I mean, the, his cover ID basically makes him out to be like a Vin Diesel character. You know, like they, like he just seems to be like a a badass. Where the way he just kind of commands respect from all these ma- big drug dealers and stuff. You know, it seems unbelievable what his history is, right? Uh huh. They just release him. We have a brief scene where Tubbs and Crockett go back to him to see that the room has been trashed, and then we go to the club. We're gonna have another Grossero meet. Do we find out why the room is trashed? I think it's just more gr- gr- Grossero men checking up on them. If the, if they tried to kill them in the alley, and then they knew where they were staying, like doesn't it seem like Tubbs and Crockett should have been killed like fifty times over already in in Colombia? Yeah. Yeah, and. So I got the impression that it was that Toto was letting Tubbs out, uh, be, like at the at the interest of Grossero, 
not because of Miami Vice or DA or anyone else getting involved. But then wouldn't Tubbs be a little peeved when he comes back to the hotel room and is just like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> where, like, where were you? Why did like, you guys leave me there? <laughs> <laughs> when were you planning to let me out? At this point, they let me out. So I'm like, you've done nothing. Me and Jimmy <laughs> were having the talk and um, <laughs> it, it, it got, you know, it, it got real, man. And we just didn't have time to come pick you up, Tubbs. Well, now, now we go to the club. Grossero's sitting in the middle of the dance floor. Watching a young boy dance, like, it was so creepy. There's so much weird stuff. There's like, yeah, so it's like a young boy dancing. And that boy is like, in all the scenes, wherever Grossero is, there's like this 10 or 12 year old boy with no shirt on, just hanging out around Grossero. Why is it so steamy in there? Yeah, so there's like smoke coming out from behind Grossero as he is sitting yeah. there it, it's like they're actually in like in a steam room except they're not mm-hmm. they're not all in towels and nothing so it's like why is it so steamy in there why is there so much <laughs> mist <laughs> don't i don't understand where are they really <laughs> it was and- supremely creepy watching that because that boy looks really uncomfortable too but like afraid to stop moving so mm-hmm. he's like slowly dancing uh, yeah, and then, I don't know. This one of my favorite parts of this episode is when they kind of come up with the uh, plan for the exchange. So magically, that for some reason, when they toss the hotel room, they didn't find the million dollars. So they still have to do the exchange for drugs. They're still arguing over the price. Mm-hmm. They're still trying to dick him down on yeah, the price. Yeah, Tums essentially comes in there. He pulls a gun on him first. After he got patted down, he's got one of those sweet guns up the sleeve, and he like snaps it out. Like, to impose it on Grossero, who's super surprised when he sees it. Tubbs essentially strong arms him into a deal at 25000 per kilo and does it on all his own terms. You're going to meet me here. This is how we're going to do the exchange. He's going to be two cars. Like, he lays it all down. Grossero does not look happy, but he concedes to, to, to make this deal. So then Crockett goes to try and explain how this deal is going down. And it seems to be, he seems to come up with the most elaborate, most over the top way for this to go down. We need a red car and we need a blue car. And you'll drive the red car, and then he'll drive the blue car, and then we're all going to meet at 7th Street, <laughs> yeah. and then we're going to jump out and switch cars real quick. And Only then, after we get Slurpees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's like, wait a minute. You guys are all there right now. Why don't you just give them the million dollars, take the keys, go back to the plane? Yeah. Why do you have to have, why do you have to have someone go rent multiple cars <laughs> so that, I mean, I get they don't trust him. But it just seems like a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they go to the they go to the cemetery. They make the exchange. Not n- nothing happens at the exchange. Each of them tests their goods. Grossero checks for the money. Tubbs checks for a, in a random key to make sure that the stuff is good. Exchange goes fine. Again, that kid, that weird kid, is just kind of hanging out in the in there watching them. Too. And during the exchange, they keep going back and forth with these. Really suspicious looks between Tubbs and Groceros. And it's not like, you know, like they just like staring each other down. It's like Tubbs looks at Groceros and then the camera jumps to Groceros looking at Tubbs and then back, uh, back to Tubbs looking at Groceros and it goes back and forth like four or five times. And it's like, why are they staring at each other so much? I don't know. Just I don't get know. in the car. The whole Columbia thing was, was really weird. It was weirder than meeting Jimmy and Wavy Davy. If yes. it was possible. Yes. Yeah. And the fact is, we are we have not even come close to the halfway point of why they're even in Colombia. No. Well, no, they're almost done in Colombia, but we've had all this stuff because the next thing they're going to do is they're going to go to the airport. They run up. Jimmy's already starting the plane. They start throwing the stuff in the airplane. Some Grossero's men come. They see him at a distance, come driving up. There's a brief shootout and a dash to the plane outlaw country <laughs> yeah crockett like instead of shooting he drives around and then rams one of the cars that that and then that crashes it into the other car which looks a lot like the van from back to the future that's did it, uh, ch- chasing did it explode no it didn't explode <laughs> so maybe things aren't combustible in columbia those those fine made colombian vehicles you know? <laughs> <laughs> not like those the shit american exploders <laughs> but they're able to escape and they fly back to Miami. As they're when they get close to so Miami. Just, just a side note: every time we have a scene like this one where they're going to get into the airplane, they play 
Glenn Fry's Smuggler's Blues. So this is about the third or fourth time they've played the same song. <laughs> and that's, that's, that, that's kind of why I made the outlaw country, uh, hit is that it's a little smoky in the bandit style. <laughs> yeah. And that every time they have a shenanigan, they play the same song. Yeah. Yeah. And so when they're flying back, they drop the drugs into like a lake or a river, not a river, but it's like the bayou or maybe a lake or something like that. They drop the drugs into that they're going to come back and get later. They don't explain why, but it's got to be just that's a drug trade trick that you don't land with the stuff on the plane. Right. We have a short montage where it's like a flyover over Miami, like a tourist video as they're, as they're coming in. Oh, wait. I forgot to to point out like the one of the best parts when they meet up at the cemetery and that like the whole video montage leading up to that where it like zooms in and out on all of the monuments around the oh, cemetery yeah, yeah. and it's like that weird like a uh, what's I'm trying to think of what what that's called but there's like a filter that just shows a little bead of light at the center of all of the statues. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it just like zooms in and out and in and out and then to the next one and in and out and in and out. The whole like all of the video uh the videography throughout this episode was just really strange. And you know, who was the director again? It was oh the guy from Caldon's Return Part Two, which was clunky. Mm-hmm. That's that's part of that was part of the issue with that episode is that it was just it was just awkward. Right. So we go to, after we get the flyover over Miami, we go to Tubbs and Crockett have gone back to that lake to go pick up their drug haul. As they're fishing it out of the water, Wavy Davy and his compadre make an appearance to go steal the drugs from Tubbs and Crockett. Not only are they going to steal the drugs, but they also tell them that they've captured Trudy. And at first they say they have, and then the story changes later, and that they want $500,000 and they'll release both. Tubbs and Crockett are like, hey, Tubbs like, you're not drug dealers. I'm like, yeah, you're right, we're not. We're we, we don't five, we're holding Trudy ransom too. Which brings me to the point where, was it that the point? Was, isn't that why Trudy was the bait? Why is no one watching Trudy? Why is she all alone and able to be kidnapped if the whole point was, we're gonna watch her and then when they come, we're going to arrest them. Yeah, because that's what these this drug dealer does, is that they have smugglers, and the way they strong-arm the smugglers is that they capture their family and say that they're going to kill them if they don't deliver it. Yeah. Apparently, the DEA is no better at surveillance than the Miami Vice Department is. Well, and what we find, that I mean, it's basically everyone just forgot about Trudy. They forgot her whole part in this. They got down there, and they started buying drugs and watching boys dance, and they just completely forgot the whole point of all of this was because Trudy was going to be baked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the whole point of this. So it doesn't make any sense. But right when they're getting ready, like they've they've got Tubbs and Crockett pinned down, Jimmy shows up. And Jimmy apparently wasn't part of this. At first, I thought when he came pulling up that this was Jimmy deal. That's why yeah. he was so hands-on with the deal. But it's not. He just, he's like, he's telling Wavy Davy, like, he asked him, like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why, why are you doing this? Then a shootout starts. We have, it's, it's a typical Miami Vice shootout. Crockett knocks the gun out of one person's hand. Jimmy gets shot. Tubbs grabs a gun from, uh, from that was put underneath the car in the beginning of the episode and proceeds to shoot his own car <laughs> like five times. <laughs> He is not successful in, in shooting anyone except shooting through his uh, convertible top. I mean, he needs to make this look believable just in case they end up with bodies, okay? So. <laughs> well, they did end up with bodies because I think Wavy Davy's partner is no more. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I know that Crockett, like, he gets a, he gets a hold of him, but mm-hmm. does, does he kill him? I don't know because we don't see him again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and- God they're at a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go lug this guy around. <laughs> Even though Wavy Davy's been shot, he's still alive, and he tells him that he didn't actually kidnap Trudy. He was told someone else kidnapped Trudy, told him to go get Tubbs and Crockett and the drugs, and tell them that they need to pay the five hundred thousand. And that after he got the drugs, and told him that he was supposed to get a phone call. So they drag Wavy Davy bleeding to the payphone where he's supposed to get a call, which is another great timing. As soon as, he show, as soon as they show up, the phone's ringing. And there's no wait, which is great in this episode because we don't have to deal with this anymore. Oh, yeah. And then we then this show just dates itself. 
right yeah. then and there because they can't get a fix on the boss's location because he used one of them fancy cell phone thingies <laughs> and they're untraceable. And then the and then Zwitek comes pulling up and says that they that they can't figure out where Trudy is. They have no idea what's going on. The vice team is just in chaos now. Their entire plan has fallen apart, and they've given a million dollars to a drug dealer in Cartagena. And they can't remember where the what hotel they rented for Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was the Holiday Inn. No, no, no. It was the Motel 6. At the last second, they get a call to head out to a site. They head out to this, what looks like a construction site. And they can see opposite of the construction site, there's, you can see in the same setup as in the very beginning with the houseboat. Trudy is tied up inside of a mobile home that's on the opposite end of the construction zone. The Miami Police Department is there. The whole vice team is there. Everyone is on hands because they know from the beginning is probably set up with a bomb. And the the discussion's kind of weird because you almost get the feeling like they're like they're like, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. Like you you expect them to just go, well, screw it, it's just Trudy. We'll just <laughs> we'll just let her die. <laughs> now, meanwhile, Gina is advocating pretty strongly, and this is what we had talked about earlier in the episode. But she wants the chance, like she wants to be the one to go in and do this, and. Yet again, Castillo totally shafts the women on the vice department and says, no, it'll be Crockett that goes, which, I mean, I disagree with on many levels. Shut your damn hole, Sally. (laughs) Power to Gina in wanting to do this. And also, Crockett is by far the most attractive person on that force. So I really feel like they need to hold him back on more (laughs) more things. Quit putting him in his face in danger's way. Yeah, that's (laughs) the moneymaker, okay? I like the bomb squad guy too, because he's he he doesn't he doesn't look like a, he would be a bomb squad guy. He looks like just like a regular Joe, just like a blazer. Mm-hmm. And he goes in there and he just starts MacGyver and stuff. Like, get me a roll of wire and a nine volt. <laughs> Let's go. We're gonna figure this bad boy out. <laughs> so the bomb squad guy and Crockett sneak around they get inside and they see the bomb it's like got multi switches on it there's some great names that they call for it like the trembler is one of the switches that's on this bomb. <laughs> which <laughs> picks up any movement and stuff and so oh no it's got a sh- it's got the shocker yeah oh yeah and, and any 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 sudden movement and we're wallpaper <laughs> because that's what you should say to the woman who's tied up on top of a bomb and trudy's really nervous and this is exactly why gina should have went in they're like so the bomb squad guy uh I, don't, I forget his name sam yeah they he's like hey i can't disarm this she's shaking too much and so crockett like talks her down nicely and so it's like this is exactly why gina should have went and then she whimpers and he goes yeah we're gonna need to be quiet dude no sound <laughs> like, okay sam have some fucking tact please thank you like <laughs> he's busy sitting on his hand because he's about to give her the stranger <laughs> So Castillo and the team gets a call outside from the dealer who says that, okay, go to this bridge. It's the um, South Beach Bridge in 20 minutes. And Tubbs realizes, like, they're going to blow it if we don't deliver it. They're going to blow it if he does. Like, we have no way. We have to get Trudy out of there. We're not going to win this battle. And then we have, like, a back and We have, like, a slight back and forth. Tubbs goes to the bridge with the money. They're back to the corner. They have to go. But meanwhile, they're still trying to, to disarm the bomb. So. I love Castillo's response, too, because Tubbs doesn't know what to do here. And he calls her. They're on. Yeah, they're on. Yeah, like pieces yeah and he, he's asking castillo what to do and castillo pretty much goes goes not my problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, castillo should be the dick this whole episode but yeah so After like everything that they did for him and then he goes and it's just like, being like him Tubbs is trying to figure out how, a way to stall so that trudy doesn't get blown to the smithereens and lieutenant's like i'm not there it's not my problem <laughs> deal with it <laughs> As they're getting closer, they're still disarming the bomb. As they get closer, they're still disarming the bomb. The boat comes underneath the bridge, and he's Tubbs like, I have to, I have to drop the drugs. Right before then, though, my favorite scene of the whole episode is this, is this like 10 second scene. Tubbs is standing and he's looking over the bridge, and then he steps back and he puts and he and he steps back and then he thinks for a second. He puts his hand to his chin. Someone behind him is like pulling a net out of the water. For some reason, the director thought that scene wasn't long enough. They needed it to be longer. So it plays in reverse. He takes his hand down and then goes and looks over the bridge. It would be totally fine if it wasn't for the person in the net but with the net behind him. You see him pull it up and then stop and then start to unfurl it. <laughs> I totally missed that. That's so 
<laughs> yeah, it is, it is terrible. It's by far the worst editing I've seen in a Miami Vice episode, and that's saying wow. a lot. I yeah. knew there was something suspicious about those damn fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that that guy does all day is just like, he never actually successfully brings it up he just starts to pull it up and then lets it back down well at the last minute Tubbs decides after he tra- he's gonna drop the dogs in he thinks about it and then he, then he jumps in at the back of the boat there's a brief struggle and then he pu- he's able to get a gun out on the guy and, and the guy has the, the bomb trigger classic like TV show bomb trigger uh-huh. giant antenna big red button you that know. boat better not go under <laughs> 55 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> there's a slight exchange and the person with with the button decides like well i'm screwed anyway and he hits the button trailer explodes Cro- Tubbs shoots the smuggler dealer Tubbs killed the ninja or <laughs> uh, or a sad dolphins fan dressed as a ninja <laughs> he goes yeah, and he like jumps himself back into the water like he got hit and then we learned that Trudy and Sam and Crockett got out okay. Everyone is okay. They pull the body out of the water and we're going to get our big reveal. This is our big reveal on who the dirty cop is in this episode. And it turns out to be Lieutenant Jones. The person we met for literally 10 seconds in the beginning of the episode was the crooked cop. How about, how about them dolphins? <laughs> and he would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that pesky Glenn Fry. <laughs> this was such a lame twist at the end. Why? So why have another dirty cop story if it was going to be someone we have no idea who the hell it is? I, I don't know. I mean, it didn't need to have the dirty cop story. If it was going to be about the Columbia aspect, be about the Columbia aspect. Forget about the the kidnapping angle. Like... Like, why did you need to stretch? Did you just need to fill five minutes of show? Um, because if you total up the beginning, the open with the explosion and following the guy, and then you total up the time from when Tubbs throws it, the money over and they save Trudy, you have about five, maybe ten good minutes of show, and the rest of it is in Columbia. Well, I mean, I just don't understand the bad, like the bad cop angle, because couldn't they have just said that? They're seeing a lot of smuggling come in. They're trying to stop like a drug trade, right? And and they're seeing that many of these people are like the whole kidnapping, all of that stuff still absolutely makes sense without there needing to be the dirty cop angle. So yeah. this would have been a much bigger deal reveal if you find out that the DEA agent who's setting it all up is the one who's been orchestrating all of this stuff. And it's like just trying to get away from it, like just trying to get them off the tail because they were doing the surveillance and getting a little bit too close that he was looking for a way to like push them off of it. Right. And they could have made that work because of all the trouble they had with Grocero in Colombia. They could have made it work like he gave them the million dollars and sent them there to get killed. I mean, we still have some time to talk about our final thoughts on this episode. I think it kind of sounds like we're in agreement. This episode sucked. Let's uh, let's move on to the music segment. All right, Sean, I think this music segment is pretty simple because I think we got Smuggler's Blues, Smuggler's Blues, and Smuggler's Blues. What do you got for us this week? Okay, so you were right. There are two songs in this episode, one being, you guessed it, Smuggler's Blues by Glenn Fry. What? And so Smuggler's Blues was on, uh, is on the album The Alt Nighter, which was released in 1984 by Glenn Fry. And this is few years after the Eagles officially broke up and disbanded, and everyone kind of started their own solo careers. So this song, uh, and this album, is basically the second solo album from Glenn Fry, and this is his him trying to be pick up popularity as a solo artist. And the song was so awesome that it inspired Miami Vice to make an episode. That's what's crazy here, is that it wasn't that they had heard the song and they were forced into a, a contract of like, Glenn Fry is doing a solo career. We got to do an episode where, where we work in Glenn Fry. And it wasn't just a regular episode. That they actually, and then just put Glenn Fry as a character. And they actually took the song and then turned the song into an episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing is they liked, the writers liked the song so much. It inspired them to write the episode. And then they thought it would be fun to have him as a guest star too in the episode. So basically, uh, 
the song Smuggler's Blues inspired this, all of this bad, bad TV. But it did lead to a semi-successful career for Glenn Fry, a solo career for Glenn Fry. And then eventually he would tour later in life with, with the Eagles. I just assumed that this was like true 80s fashion where like in movies where you'd see the recap at the end, they would have hired someone to do a song about what happened. I assume that they had this episode and then they decided to have Glenn Fry. like he was now like doing solo projects, trying some new stuff. Maybe he wanted to try acting. And so they thought, oh, bonus, we have a like a guest star who's a musician. And then he wrote the song like for for the episode. And that would make more sense. Like right. he watched the episode like... Right. Uh, Mad Max Thunderdome. Oh, like, and Tina Turner sing, made that song for the movie after watching the movie, basically. So it, 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 it's even deeper than that. So it wasn't just hearing the song. What really inspired them is the music video for the song. If you watch the music video for the song, it is basically what they were trying to go for in this episode in the music video. The music video being made for they made this episode. So they're basically taking hit Glenn Fry's music video and going, we could turn that into a Miami <laughs> Vice episode fairly easily. So... I thought that was interesting, and I, I just I want to touch on the other song in the episode because in the open I talked about earlier is the song "Lunatic Fringe" by Red Rider, and I like this song. I really like this song, but I like most things Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is on the album "As Far as I Am," and yes, uh, like I just said, it is Canadian band, and they released it in 1981. Now, the song itself is written to boot the rise <laughs> <laughs> of anti-Semitism in the 70s. A eh? is this is this also after a, a pillow? What was it last time? A pillow? A pillow hitting therapy session? No, no, no I don't therapy. think we'll ever get as epi- epic as the the pillow fight therapy session and i'm a little suspicious about the them saying that the song is the boot to rise and <laughs> anti-semitism um because i don't remember my uh, there being a much of a rise of anti-semitism in the 70s in the u.s so i'm wondering if this was a canadian thing if people just started getting really hard on jewish people in the 70s in Canada. And what would that entail? Like, did one person just say something kind of rude? And they're like, we're just not having this. <laughs> we're going to write a song about this. <laughs> that was extremely rude, Bill. <laughs> but what what makes uh, Red Rider great is that the band itself, initially, when they started, before they even released like their first album, they already were changing members. And so they brought in, early in the band beginning, they, bring, they brought in Tom Cochran to be part of the band. Band. And as soon as they brought him in as another member of the band, two of the band members abruptly quit because they didn't want him in the band. So that led to them hiring Jeff Jones, who is the former bassist, uh, the original bassist for Rush. Yeah. Because another all Canadian ca- band. Yeah. Because all Canadians know each other. Yes. We, we need a bassist. Oh, just call Rush. <laughs> they bring him in. And they are pretty successful. That's when they do Lunatic Fringe. And they're ex- they're really successful, extremely successful for a Canadian band. I'm not not stabbing, making fun of Canadians. Um, but, <laughs> but th- uh, there is a hierarchy, okay, if we talk about man, measure your success based on country here in the U.S. So U.S. is at the top, right? And then the U.K. is right below that. And then there's Canadians and then Australians. Yes. It's amazing if Australians get radio play. Yes. So, yeah, Red Rider for a while there, they were up there with Huey Lewis and Brian Adams, like they were just killing it. And then after about five or six years, another couple of the original members of the band left. And it seemed like when this happened, all of a sudden, and I want to say Jeff, that's when Jeff Jones left as well. And when this happened, all of a sudden, like every year they were replacing a band member to the point where from the 1980s or late 70s, when the band came out, all the way until now, because they still tour to this day, there have been 19 different band members. So pretty much whoever's touring this day is Red Rider. Not a single one of them is originally from Red Rider, from what I can tell. Uh, Yeah, just 19 different members over the years. I mean, there's just no one in the band left touring as Red Rider, but they still tour every year. That's crazy that they still tour. Uh-huh. That there's still enough people going to watch them. I mean, it's got to be county fairs and stuff, right? Yeah, and to be honest with you, 
I can't name any other songs other than Lunatic Fringe that they did that I like. I knew beforehand before researching the band. Uh, the last thing I'll, I will say is that Lunatic Fringe has been used in a few different other areas of popular media. It was in the movie Vision Quest, which has a tie for this next part where it is also used in the WWE as Kurt Angle's entry song. Nice. And it is also used by UFC current fighter and future Hall of Famer Dan Henderson. There's a Hall of Fame of the UFC? There will be, Jenna. There will be. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Those crazy Canadians, you know, the Red Rider is... I'm trying to think of a good band to compare them to. I want to say they're the the Night Ranger of Canada. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a good fit. Well, on that bombshell, let's move on to our closing thoughts. All right, guys, this was a stinker, and I blame this solely on Glenn Fry. Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I wouldn't blame it on Glenn at all. (laughs) I feel like he was actually a pretty redeemable character in this. He did a good job, and of which we will we're definitely watching this now because i found the i found his music video for it <laughs> like for all we know he had a much better vision okay than uh than than the writer uh, who was it? our former miguel pinero there you go uh mm-hmm. who wrote this episode so i mean i thought honestly like it wasn't it wasn't the worst episode that we've seen it wasn't the best it was pretty forgettable for me um i i really actually did kind of like all of the scenes with glenn fry uh mostly because he was like clearly madly in love with crockett and and i get that <laughs> um and I, i'm looking forward to more ep- other episodes well you know my thoughts are like i felt really bad for gina and trudy in this episode, like they got really slighted right. in this, and it's kind of changing my opinion on Castillo, which was already sliding after seeing him in a speedo. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't know how I feel about Marty right now. I, you know, you're right. The episode is forgettable. There's not a whole lot that happens in it. I will say I'm greatly disappointed that there was a character named Wavy Davy, and it did not live up to my shaggy expectations. Yes. John, what are your final thoughts? Uh, so I, I understand what Jenna's saying. I mean, Glenn Fry himself didn't do a terrible job in the episode, but it just, to me, it felt like Miami Vice meets Santa Claus. Miami Vice meets Kiss, you know? It was clearly just a team-up style special episode, like something that probably shouldn't have been run in tandem during the season, but they tried to make it that way anyway. So I just, and I'm sitting here looking at the beginning of Glenn Fry's music video, and I, I think I think Jenna's suspicion is right. I think the music video is going to be better than this actual episode. <laughs> so I'm just... I don't know. I'm just hoping we don't get too many more of these guest star episodes like this inspired by music videos. And deep down, I really want to see Trudy uh, Trudy get her moment because Mm -hmm. it has got to be coming. She has got to have that. Gina had her episode already. We've seen enough of Sonny Crockett and we've even seen enough of the B team. I want to... Trudy's character to have her big storyline or big plot or just something something yeah Yeah, something that gets her more involved absolutely I'm sick of her being just like someone that helps drive something forward she's Mm -hmm. like on the back end of of all of the the big cases that they're breaking yeah yeah well that's gonna do it for us this week with go with the heat your enthusiast podcast to the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice we are having Our first recording where all three of us are in the exact same room. So if you notice any minor audio changes, we are working through some bugs to do this live recording together with hope. We hope to do a whole bunch of these. And while we're together, actually recording a whole bunch of episodes, including some bonus material that might come out at a later date. No promises on that stuff, but we're going to work on it while we're all together in the, in the same place. We hope you enjoy the show. Be sure to subscribe. Check out our website, goalwiththeheat.com. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at goalwiththeheat at gmail. Com. You can also go to our website, click on subscribe, and find all the ways that you can communicate with us. We would love to hear from you and your enthusiasm for Miami Vice. And hey, maybe we got this one wrong. We seem to be pretty down on this episode. So if you happen to like Glenn Fry in Miami Vice, shoot us a message and let you know. Let us know what you think. That's gonna do it for us this week, and we'll see y'all next week. Bye, pals. Dynamite.